sustainability in super tall buildings is, is really uh, uh, today related to their mixed use occupancies. You know, a lot of these uh, high profile super tall buildings are catalysts for the neighborhood. They create a, an environment around them that creates development and other buildings. So sustainability is really, uh, should be measured as a city rather than an individual building. Uh, because they're generally iconic, they're not uh, oftentimes highly sustainable, but they uh, provide a, uh, a starting point for development. We all saw what happened with uh, Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. Those of you who have been there, uh, there was nothing there, and now there's a, a, a lot of life and a lot of activity around that area, and there's a lot of uh, economic growth for, for the project. Uh, the Kingdom Tower project will essentially do the same thing. Uh, the idea is a uh, very large development. This master plan on the side is actually uh, the overall plan for the, for the project. It's 120 million square meter, uh, uh, square meter feet development and has in it many, many components of a city, so people actually don't have to travel anywhere. They can just go there and live and work and play as they wish. Uh, the projects are uh, generally highly visible. Those of you who know Chicago, I'm from Chicago, so uh, we all know Chicago with Sears Tower, or, or now we call it Willis. It, it's really an iconic city. Those who come to Chicago, they all look for this in the city of Chicago. It's very visible. The same is going to happen with Kingdom Tower. It, it's a centerpiece of a big development that's uh, going to create a skyline there and, and a sort of a iconic view of it. Uh, these buildings have uh, a very high level of aesthetic that needs to be maintained. Uh, obviously, the best aesthetic of these buildings are going to be at the base of it where people actually see them. And also, when you come in to, uh, to the area, and be able to visible from the outside. Uh, they require, uh, in order to develop them uh, effectively, they require a highly integrated approach to all the systems and all the uh, components together. So the solutions are actually uh, are overlapped and take advantage of the occupancy separations, take advantage of the design of the building, shape of the building, all that from day one. A uh, little bit about uh, the idea of the height is, is there. There's been a lot of questions I know I came here uh, a couple years ago. There was a big question about is, uh, is there a limit to height? I think certainly there's a limit to height. Uh, may not be uh, visible to all of us, but cost is a big factor. The building has to be economically feasible and allow a uh, good return or reasonable return and eventually, in this case, would be the, the neighborhood that's going to bring the economics for that development. Uh, the materials that are used uh, have limitations in them, especially in case of the MEP design. We are limited with some uh, sizes and capacities and, and uh, limitation on pressures that we can install to these buildings. So uh, uh, we, we need to adhere to those requirements. We all know elevator technology has a limitation. There's, uh, I think this project actually pushes the limit all the way to the end. The current technology uh, is, uh, is the one that, that really accommodates the uh, elevating system in this building. The next generation of this it needs to go taller. It needs to, go to, ha needs to have a, another set of elevator technology that, that can go higher or faster, perhaps. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, human factor, human uh, comfort is also important. You know, at, at higher elevations, those of you who have uh, been on the plane, you know, as we go higher, the temperatures change. It becomes cooler in a different environment, and the sun becomes harsher. So uh, uh, can we build taller? I think we can, but we need to think about uh, factors that affect the, uh, the overall. Another area that's very, very important from a limitation standpoint is building codes. Currently, building codes do not really recognize the construction of the super tall buildings. Every super tall building has gone through an understanding of code and probably take that to the next level by uh, coming up with new ideas, working with the local authorities, looking, working with code officials, try to come up with uh, solutions that will facilitate an economic approach to that particular design. So every, every super tall building learns from the previous ones and what codes and, and, and upgrades they did and try to take it to the next level. 
Uh, and we did talk about the uh, MEP systems. Obviously, uh, maximum system loads is, is an issue. Uh, the previous presentation talked about uh, uh, the limitations of those, where you can configure them. Uh, we can't distribute from a central location, so uh, a very tall building, taller than what we have today or what we have planned for it, is going to require completely uh, separate systems that are stacked on top of one another. You need to really uh, think about that. And in fact, this project is configured that way. This project is configured with 20, 30-story buildings that stack on top of one another as we go through we talk about it. And then there are other uh, limitations we talked about, it, uh, pressure and, and also uh, overall feasibility of the construction, crane, many other limitations that are not necessarily on the MEP side, but more on the construction side. Uh, there are uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, we did talk about the, uh, the system pressure. I believe the, uh, the piping pressure and, and the components is going to be a big area for tall buildings. Uh, commercial buildings have not really adopted to uh, higher pressure installations. Those of you who have done oil and gas design, you know that they are, their are systems available to 14, 15,000 PSI, uh, but they're not adaptable to commercial uh, application. So we need to be limited to uh, what's available to us in commercial uh, grade that becomes economical installation. So those are some of the greatest uh, challenges as I see overall. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that as we go through Kingdom Tower project. Those of you that are not familiar with the project, it's a mixed use. It has uh, five uh, stages of uh, high-end condominiums. They go from uh, level one condominium to all the way level four or five. And I say it goes from a super condominium to a very super condominium, <laughs> how you want to call it. They're basically palaces that are up high. Uh, it has a luxury hotel, it has office space at the base, uh, has an observation deck, and also has a very large podium at, at the base with a, a parking arrangement for the project. When it completed, it's going to be the uh, centerpiece of the development as we talked about, and it will be the uh, next tallest building in the world. Over a kilometer tall, it, in it, this current design has over 400 kilometers of pipe for building services. Uh, these are, again, risers and distributions, uh, fairly extensive. If you look at the height of the building, uh, it imposes a water column pressure of approximately 100 bars, or 1450 PSI, so that we know there's no uh, piping system or anything in the building that can be commercially available that we can accommodate that. So what we have done here, we've uh, created three primary vertical zones to isolate that and limit the pressure to 27 to uh, 32 bars. And at the end user, where the residential units are, we've limited that to uh, 10 bar, which is approximately 150 PSI. And that's a standard pressure installation. Most FANCO units, small units, or standard design is 150 PSI. So what it does by creating this kind of arrangement, it makes the project very economical. You're not paying for a high installation cost, and you're not paying also a specialized installation cost. Welding has to be specialized for higher pressures. Uh, looking at the overall uh, configuration of the project, uh, we have uh, this diagram doesn't show very well, but I want to just do an overlay of that. There is uh, several uh, zones. Uh, the primary zone of the project is actually uh, these two zones here, which is approximately 32 bars. They're, uh, again, to the limit of the manufacturer that are available for us with the heat exchangers and pumping system. Uh, we have, at the top of the building, we have uh, another smaller zone, but the problem with the uh, height is that as you go through these heat exchangers, you lose effectiveness of a heat exchanger and you lose temperature. It degrades. So what we have done, we've installed a small air-cooled chiller at the top of the building to inject back into the loop some additional cooling so they can uh, accommodate the requirements for the project. The project itself receives uh, uh, chill water from the uh, central uh, district system that's uh, adjacent to the site. In addition to that, we have some additional uh, zones that are on the secondary side. 
And then the final arrangement of the system is 10 bars. So every one of these zones you see here is basically small zones and pictures of 20, 30 story buildings sitting on top of one another. This is a conventional residential building. Nothing, uh, nothing unusual for it. Uh, the same concept really applies with the uh, electrical system. Uh, tall buildings, uh, I call them vertical cities. So uh, the, the configuration of it is just like uh, you distribute in a neighborhood horizontally. You take that entire distribution concept and let it stand up, make it vertical. So what we have done here, <clears throat> we have a high voltage system that comes to the building. Uh, with multiple cables, multiple lines, and it distributes within a building in two dedicated primary vertical high voltage risers. These risers are embedded inside the, uh, the triangular core, the shear coil, which is completely protected. And when it gets to the mechanical level, there are seven mechanical levels in the project. It comes into a double-ended arrangement, and from there, it would distribute either up or down through bus bars Again, those distributions are just like small buildings and stack, stack on top of another, so there's nothing really to it. We all have done that. Um, the emergency system follows exactly the same uh, configuration as this and uh, mimic exactly the same process where the, the lines come through a separate dedicated riser and integrate with the uh, switchboards that are normal power and back up that system. By doing that, you have a very robust and very uh, highly reliable system. Multiple cables, if risers are uh, disconnected, you always have to have a capability to feed from a separate direction. And at the uh, load centers, you have an automatic transfer switch that switches back and forth between your normal emergency. Uh, talking about uh, the mechanical levels, again, this building has uh, seven uh, primary mechanical levels. There are two-story spaces. Uh, they're configured in a 20 to 30, roughly, uh, floors that serve by one mechanical level, uh, small grouping. And they're also overlaid with the uh, occupancy of the building to accommodate uh, uh, required metering and submetering that they would need to, and also operationally, they'd be able to isolate parts of the building without affecting the rest of the, the systems. Uh, these are some of the typical uh, mechanical levels. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, MEP layouts, you see these are actually very congested. I call these uh, structural floors. They're not really mechanical floors. Uh, structurally, they had to be reinforced, so uh, the space could not really be used for uh, any other occupancy. So what we did, we used those individual cells that you see here to house the mechanical equipment. It protects the system very well, but also it, it makes it very difficult. You can see actually some of these ductwork penetrate through uh, controlled openings. This project had a... Uh, very interesting structural system. The columns do not really transfer. They start from the base of the building, go all the way up to the top. They basically drop off. So it's a very straightforward. Uh, structurally, uh, it was economical not to have a lot of penetrations, a lot of openings. We had devised with the structural team a guideline of what size opening we have to accommodate for pipes and where they need to be implemented throughout the building and how far apart they needed to be from each other exactly so structurally it would not aff affect the rebar design and those kind of things. So there were approximately 17,000 openings that we had to coordinate individually uh, throughout the project, and they're all done through Revit model. Uh, every pipe you see here goes through an opening and is controlled somewhere. So the lower left, uh, level of the mechanical has a high voltage gear on one corner, has a uh, fire pumping system on another corner, has domestic pumping system here, and it has primarily the heat exchangers and normal equipment uh, that are related to mechanical for the rest of the floor. The floor above, on this corner, we have uh, uh, fire protection water storage. That pumping is directly below it, so it goes by gravity to the pump uh, or come up to, the, to it. Domestic the same way on this side, and then some air handling units 
there's blue lines and then electrical gear going to the core. The system was, again, uh, created as a standardization approach to give us a repetitive type of arrangement. And in my opinion, sustainability in a very tall building comes from creating standardized approaches and the standardized components. The switch gears, the fans, all the equipments are the same size throughout. We just repeated them here and there to make sure that you can troubleshoot them once for one mechanical level and repeat them through. Uh, so standardizing the size and arrangement and configuration of the system is, is a very important part of the, the design. Uh, zoning approach for the, uh, the, this project uh, allowed us to uh, take advantage of the uh, primary side diversification, which is on the, uh, on the cooling side. And if you look at the variable occupancy that this building has with office at the base, hotel, and residential, they all operate at different hours. So when you overlap those, you're able to take advantage of the downsizing of the overall system, the primary system, at 25%. I know some of the buildings, some of the uh, tall buildings are designed with multiple central plants, one at the base, one in the middle, one at the top. Uh, those systems cannot be diversified. So uh, we, we need to look at that uh, from... Uh, we did talk about standardization, and in my opinion, it really lowers the cost of the building and also uh, uh, simplifies the troubleshooting and allows us to uh, build part of the building and, and commission it and then let the contractor repeat those. Makes it very simple and, and quick installation and handover. Uh, Kingdom Tower HVAC system is is taking advantage of a lot of uh, variations of the temperature and those kind of things. Uh, this is a uh, overall diagram of the, uh, the weather data for Jetta. As you can see here, uh, there's a, a zone, a small zone within a comfort area. Uh, most of the uh, hours, uh, the building is in a cooling mode. It has a uh, very high temperature outdoor, but it also allows us to take advantage of the cool days, primarily in winter and also in uh, uh, spring and, uh, and fall, to be able to vent the building. So the, the systems being centrally configured in the mechanical levels, serving up and down, they have capability to purge the building when the, uh, the outside temperature allows. Energy recovery is also implemented into the fresh air system. Most of the residential Operations have a primary makeup air and exhaust system that runs most of the time. Uh, the, the energy recovery is really an integral part of that uh, to make the system very efficient. We're also recovering the condensate from the uh, air conditioning system to be used for irrigation at the base for the large podium. Uh, this building produces approximately 65,000 liters per day of condensate. Uh, that's equivalent to... Uh, 10 uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool per year. It's a lot of water coming out of the system, and we were able to capture that and reuse it for uh, irrigation. Uh, here is the overall uh, system configurations. You can see that in all of these systems, starting with the uh, water side and, and air, uh, electrical, uh, this is emergency electrical, which is really mimics exactly what the uh, normal power is. Uh, we have a uh, fire alarm system, again, uh, repetitive through redundant risers. Uh, grounding system, this is essentially using three legs of the building. You can see three lines there looped every so often. <coughs> Taking from the top of the building all the way down, this is for lightning protection. And uh, domestic, as well as uh, the uh, drainage, which is both... Uh, uh, it has a dual pipe system, collection with gray, gray water that's currently taken to the site, and the intent is actually off-site to treat that and bring it back to, uh, to the neighborhood for irrigation requirements. And a fire protection side of this, which I will talk about a little bit more in, in the next slide. We did talk about the uh, uh, system components. Uh, pumping is a big area, so if we wanted to build next tallest building, we all need to work with the manufacturers to come up with something that can withstand higher pressure. Uh, solar uh, 
uh, of the building uh, is, is really designed with the uh, geography in mind. Uh, the building is, uh, has a uh, south facing and then the two sides are uh, basically folding back to the north, which makes it very uh, efficient. Also these legs uh, that are going all the way up, they're solid structure, so there's really no, no glass on those walls. Uh, the temperature variation for the uh, height is, is very important. Uh, this is uh, uh, the zone of uh, troposphere, which is up to about 10 kilometer. You can see the, uh, the temperature drops approximately about 80 degrees C for that range. So for our project, it's roughly about 10 degree C difference from the bottom to the top. And it makes a, uh, a great advantage for us to size the system uh, to accommodate that. This is the zone that we're talking about for the 10,000 feet, 10,000 meters, I'm sorry. So we look at the, uh, the design condition that ASHRAE gives us is a 41 degree C and 30 wet bulb at the base of the building. When you get to the top, that temperature drops down to 35.8, which is, is a great advantage for the systems to be able to uh, size them accordingly. Uh, there's a 40% reduction in the energy required to cool fresh air and a 30% uh, lower energy from the heat gain from the wall. Stack effect is a very uh, big component of the, uh, uh, these projects that needs to be considered. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the phenomenon is the buoyancy of air. Uh, as the cold air enters the building, it rises up. In our case in Saudi Arabia, it's a hot air that comes at the top of the building and, and cools down, so it has a reverse stack effect that needs to be mitigated. And what we have done for that, we have uh, created, obviously, the vertical zoning of the systems, isolating them. Uh, we have a minimum of two separation from the core to the outside to be able to lock all the main risers from the outside. Uh, we have a balcony door control for residential. So during those high winds, the doors cannot be open. Uh, and also another advantage of this project is it has a very continuous uh, curtain wall system it does not have any uh, 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 roof offsets which potentially can leak air. Uh, we also have put all the risers in a structurally reinforced core. Uh, mechanical rooms throughout the project are designed to take advantage of the air uh, velocity from the wind for intake and also for the uh, uh, exhaust to be on the negative side to facilitate the, uh, the movement. Uh, spire in the building at the top is very unique. It's, uh, it's an empty structure, but we had to limit the size or, or the uh, temperature variation of the uh, spire. So what we did, we have a controlled stack effect variation or, uh, in, in this uh, uh, spire where the, there's a damper at the top, and we're able to control that and open it up and let the air warm up inside and ventilate the spire naturally so we can limit the temperature gradient to the limit that the structural design required, and that's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. On the uh, fire protection side, we have the entire building is uh, by gravity system. We pump water up to uh, tanks at every mechanical level, and then the system by gravity feeds down. So there's no pumping required under emergency, with the exception of the top zone that feeds the spire, and a small zone at the base that feeds the, uh, the lower level where we don't have the pressure. The rest of the building is all by gravity. In fact, we can take water from one tank and flow it to the next tank. Uh, we have two hours storage at the top, one hour at every mechanical level, and four hours at the base. Uh, so a lot of water is stored there for the project. In fact, if you have an emergency here, you would be able to drain all that water to it if it needs to be. Uh, the building also utilizes vertical uh, transportation as, as exiting. Uh, these are refuge floors. This is a whole new subject that needs to be talked about in another presentation, perhaps. Uh, in summary, uh, the successful uh, development of these super tall buildings need to uh, have an early coordination between all disciplines. You know, when you integrate the entire design team together, you can come up with solutions that are really uh, effective and, and sustainable. Uh, the ability of the structure shape orientation to take advantage of the solar and the, uh, the temperature variations on the outside is very important. 
Uh, also, zoning in the building with dedicated systems for each occupancy to allow for optimized operation and also sub-metering. Most of these buildings are mixed-use, multi-use, and they all wanted to be able to separately meter it, at least for the zone effect. And, and then uh, the systems need to work together to support load centers and provide uh, effective, reliable solution for the project. 